biology that we find in, in the world drips with mutualism, drips with evidence of a good, good God having created it. But alas, not all of biology is good. Uh, consider, for example, the existence of disease, uh, suffering, death. Uh, there's something about the biological world that is not consistent with the mutualism that we see about us. Um, in fact, we might ask the question, is this creation that we're experiencing right now, the bio biological world we see about us, is that the same biological world that we see at the end of Genesis chapter 1? God created the uh, plants and then the animals of the, of the sea and the land and the air. And then at the end of that, he says in Genesis 1.31, he looked at everything he had created and made, and behold, it was very good. When God looked down at the, at the earth that he had just created, and he said it was very good, was it an earth full of disease, suffering, pain, and death? I think not. Uh, we look at the Bible and examine it more closely. I think we see that something happened after the creation, between the creation and now, that changed the originally perfect and good creation into the one that we see today. Something happened, and I believe what happened is told to us in Genesis chapter 3, and it's the fall of the king. Remember, God created humans to be the kings of those things that are made, kings over the, the good creation. But alas, in, Je in chapter 3 of Genesis, we see that that king, humanity, d uh, disobeyed God. They sinned against God. The king fell. God created man to be ruler over the uh, creation uh, and gave them a command, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Gave just one command, and humans disobeyed that one command. When they disobeyed, the consequence of it, according to that passage, is that they will surely die. Uh, when man sinned, he died. He died spiritually at that point. He was spiritually alive, but took of that fruit, disobeying God, and spiritually died. But is it all that happened at that particular moment in time? No. God follows up man's sin with a curse. He actually curses his own creation in response to the fall of the king. Now, I'm going to make a point here, what I'm about to talk about is specifically unique to a young age creationist perspective of life. Other biological uh, courses, other biology courses, naturalistic courses, or even other Christian courses that don't accept young age creationism will not be dealing with the issue that I'm about to talk about. The curse of Genesis chapter 3 uh, gives us some clues or indications of how God, in fact, changed the biological world at the fall of man. The Lord God said unto the serpent at the beginning of this curse in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle. So there's, there's a statement here that the curse is certainly upon the, the serpent because he uh, disobeyed God's command as well. But it says the serpent is going to be cursed above the cattle. This suggests the cattle themselves, the other animals of the earth, were also cursed. So somehow the curse of uh, Genesis 3 fell upon all animals. He also said unto the woman, he turns to the woman, God does, and he says, I will greatly multiply your pain and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. Now pain, all by itself, limited quantities of it, is a good thing. Pain is something that if you put your hand on the burner of a stove, uh, pain tells you, oh, take it off of the burner. In fact, if it's fast enough, you won't do any damage to yourself. The pain will have protected yourself. Pain is a good thing to protect yourself from getting seriously injured. But if the pain persists, 
uh, continues on or if the pain gets too excessive, uh, then that's a situation we call suffering. You've gone beyond just pain necessary for good things. You have, you're experiencing excessive, unnecessary pain. We call that suffering. And what, that's what's being spoken of here. Notice God says, I will greatly multiply your pain. There was apparently pain in childbirth, or would have been pain in childbirth, before this time. But that was the amount of pain necessary to make sure that uh, the mother wasn't seriously injured in the process of giving birth. But with the curse, that pain was greatly multiplied beyond what was necessary to be a good and protective it becomes a, a matter of suffering. There would be suffering in childbearing, human childbearing anyway. He continues on with the discussion with a woman. Your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Uh, there's a change in the relationship between husband and wife. There was a, shall we say, a mutualistic relationship between husband and wife previous to this, the man would uh, rule over the woman, but not abuse that relationship. Rule as a shepherd king, uh, meeting her needs, uh, always putting her needs above his, and meeting uh, every, every need that she had. And then after that, he's, after the curse, He's not going to rule in that good way anymore. He's going to tend to push her down, to not meet her needs, to ignore her needs, to put his needs above her needs. There was a change in that relationship. On her part, before the fall, apparently, she is willing to submit to him and to let him rule over her because he's, he's, he's doing only good things in that rule. He's only providing good things for her, she would have no trouble uh, submitting to his rule. But after the fall, under the curse, she is going to rebel against it. She's going to rebel against the abuse of the power that the man has, the authority that the man has over the woman. And she's going to try to take over his authority. Then he's going to try to reassume his authority. There's going to be conflict that enters the human relationship that did not exist before the fall. We also have uh, God turns to Adam and says, Cursed is the ground. You're going to be spending your life uh, tilling the ground to get crops out of that ground, but I'm going to curse the ground so that it doesn't yield as much uh, fruit, as, as many crops as it did before. And as a result of this, you are going to find it difficult to, to do the work that you did before. Before the fall, the uh, somehow work, which existed because God, was, God gave Adam work, he put Adam into the garden to keep and to till it, uh, to maintain it. So he had a job to do. He had work to do. But I would suggest that before the fall, that work was not onerous. It was not difficult. It was not something that, oh, man, i got to go to work today. It's more like I like to think of um, how people uh, relate to their avocations, their, uh, their hobbies. Some people I know have hobbies that involve a lot of work. Like some people like tennis or something like that, which is a lot of work. For me, I don't do that very well. And so for me to, if, if I had a hobby, if I had to do tennis, I would be tired. I would not be happy. This would be, I'd be worn out. But some people play tennis as a hobby and they actually, even though it's a lot of work, they feel invigorated after doing so. If they, they seem to get more benefit out of the work than they had to put work into the work. And I suspect that's how it was before the fall for all work, that humans would in fact put work into a particular job or responsibility, but they would receive more benefit out of it than they had to invest into it. But after the fall, they're now going to have to work, going to put more energy into it than they're going to get out of it. And apparently it's due to the fact that the ground is somehow cursed. 
that the earth itself is somehow cursed or changed in the course of the, uh, of the fall. He continues in speaking to Adam. God says, the thorns and thistles shall the ground bring forth to you. So apparently before the fall, there were no thorns and thistles in the garden. After the fall, there's a different situation. Now when Adam works in the garden, he's going to have to pull out weeds, uh, thorns, thistles, and other weeds. And so there's apparently a change in the plant world. Either plants didn't have thorns and thistles before, you know, those sharp points before the fall, or the plants stayed out of the garden and didn't become weeds in places where they weren't supposed to be. Either way, plants are somehow changed. They are themselves cursed in the course of the, uh, of the curse on all things. He continues uh, with Adam. God says, you shall eat the herb of the field. If you compare this passage with the first chapter of Genesis, the first chapter, God says to Adam, he says, you shall, have the, you shall eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. You may eat freely of any of the fruit trees in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. This is a little different. Uh, so before the fall, it appears humans were what we call fruitivores. They ate fruit. They got all their nutrients, everything they needed from eating the fruit of plants. Here, after the fall, Adam has said, you shall eat of the herb of the field. You, you'll eat the actual plants. So you're going to be eating spinach now, uh, not, not fruit. Uh, there's a change in human diet that occurs at the, uh, at the fall. And God continues by saying to Adam, in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread. So here, as I was talking about, God's uh, changed things in such a way that human work increases. Uh, the burdensome nature of work increases. He continues by saying, Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So here we have the implication that if this had never happened, Adam would have lived forever, would have never died. But here... Adam, who was made from the dust of the ground, is said to have to return to the dust. So humans, as a result of the fall, as a result of the curse, are going to have to die, not just spiritually, being separated from God because of their sin, they're going to have to die physically. And if we consider this plus the biblical theme that is picked up here in the next few verses and carried through the Old Testament and on into the New, we find that there's a strong association between the uh, sacrifices of animals and the sins of humans. In fact, uh, there seems to be the death of animals is taking the place of the death of humans. Uh, and the idea there is that because of human sin, humans deserve to die. But instead of humans dying, we have, at least in the Old Testament, the establishment of the possibility that animals could die in their stead and thus uh, cover the sin of humanity, which suggests that animals didn't die before the, the sin of Adam, that the death of animals is imposed upon them uh, in order to pay later for the uh, sin of human beings. We also have the observation that in the original creation, there's apparently no predation, no animals eating other animals, because it says in the same verses that talk about humans eating uh, plants, uh, fruit in particular, it says that the animals are given the plants to eat for food. So apparently no animals in the pre-fall world, in fact, ate other animals. If that's the case, then no animals had to die for another animal to eat, to subsist. So this further indicates that perhaps before the fall, no animals in fact died at all. Uh, we also have no predators, no animals that eat other animals, at least eating animals, in the new heavens and the new earth. We have the lion laying down with the lamb and that sort of thing. We have what are now predators, 
living cooperatively or mutualistically with the uh, prey uh, that we would find in the uh, present world. So animals that now are eating other animals in the past, before the fall, didn't eat other animals, and in the future will not eat other animals. So this suggests, again, that there is in fact no death of animals before the, uh, the, the fall. Thus the curse becomes the origin of not just the death of humans, but the death of animals as well. And then one other passage, moving over to Romans chapter 8, where we read that the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, because the creature itself was made subject to corruption, uh, the bondage of corruption, but with our liberty is released from that. This bondage of corruption, spoken of in Romans chapter 8, appears to have been put on the creation, the entire creation, not just the animals and the plants and, and humans, but the entire creation was subject to the bondage of corruption. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now in this passage, but they're waiting for the whole creation is waiting for our glorification. Because when the king is glorified, the, the curse is lifted off the entire creation. This suggests that the whole creation is impacted by the curse, not just the biological creation, but the whole thing. <clears throat> and in, in the future times, uh, in Revelation chapter 21, we read, God will dwell with man, and there shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. There shall be no more crying. There shall be no more pain. And there shall be no more curse. So the curse seems to be associated with the origin of death, sorrow, crying, uh, exceeding excess pain. All of these things are a consequence of the curse itself. So what we see in this passage is that the curse is the introduction of death, suffering, and that's imposed upon the creation, the entire creation, and will persist in that creation until humans are glorified. At that time, and only at that time, will the curse be lifted. So the curse is due to the fall of the king. And I might note here, this is, it's important to understand, this did not come with the sin of Satan. Satan fell before humans did. Satan was tempting through the serpent, was tempting Eve. So he had already fallen. But when it, the, the curse on the creation or the change at the creation did not occur in response to Satan's sin, it only occurred, God only instituted it in response to human sin. Because Satan wasn't created to be the ruler of the creation, to ruler of the biological world. It was humans who were created to be rulers. So it's only the sin of the ruler that results in the curse on the creation, not the sin of another being that didn't have a function as ruler. And the curse, to restate this, to emphasize this, the curse imp impacts the entire creation. Not just the biological world, but every star, every planet, every place in the creation, every place in the universe is impacted by the curse. And it includes death, it includes the origin of all death, the death of animals, uh, the, uh, the death of humans, spiritual death. This is the origin of, the, uh, of, of, of death that is later referred to as an enemy. The last enemy to be destroyed will be the enemy of death. And death was introduced at the curse. In fact, if you look back and consider each of these things, the cursing of animals, the curse, the suffering and childbearing and so on, most of these changes are changes in relationships. They're broken relationships. There were once mutualistic relationships, now the relationships where, where each party was gaining the same amount in the, in the relationship. But after the fall, now one party benefits more than the other. Uh, works at the expense of another, actually introduces uh, conflict into relationship. 
many of these changes that occur in the curse are actually a compromise or a change of a perfect, a set of perfect relationships into a set of imperfect relationships. The curse, and I emphasize this as well, was not due to man's sin. Man's sin didn't create the curse. This is the amazing thing. God created this astonishing universe, beautiful, perfect universe with no death, no, no disease, no suffering. And then when man's sin occurred, God was the one that cursed his own creation in response to the fall of man. It is not, it's, 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 not, it's, it's certainly our fault that we sinned and thus God cursed the creation, but it wasn't our sin that cursed it. It was the Creator who cur her cursed His own creation because the King He set over that creation sinned. That's the true nature of the curse.